Well, hello and uh, welcome everyone. I'm excited to be here today at the Northwest Edmonton Police Campus. Thank you so much uh, to Chief McPhee and the Edmonton Police Service for hosting us uh, here today. I'd also like to welcome our guest today, Chief Newfeld from the Calgary Police Service, Deputy Commissioner Zablocki of the Alberta RCMP, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Day of Alberta's Virtual Opioid Dependency Program, and Edmonton Fire Chief uh, Joe Zatilny. Uh, thank you all for joining us again here today. After working as a police officer for over a decade, coming to a municipal jail is a familiar one to me. Uh, but I'm not here today as a police officer. I'm here as Alberta's Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. The addiction crisis continues to have a deep and a lasting uh, impact in all of our communities. This is concerning and is not in any way unique to Alberta. It is important now more than ever that we remain committed to expanding access to treatments for as many people as possible. That is exactly what we're doing. Just recently, we have made significant advancements in our treatment capacity, and we've been hard at work eliminating barriers to a range of services. Two years ago, we announced that we would be funding an additional 4,000 treatment spaces. Two years ahead of schedule, we've doubled that commitment and funded over 8,000 additional annual treatment spaces. This means that over 8,000 more Albertans every year can access residential detox, treatment, and recovery services. These spaces have no more user fees, completely eliminating financial barriers to treatment. Last week, we expanded the virtual opioid dependency program and began fully covering the cost of sublocade for Albertans, Sublocade uh, lasts in a person's system for 30 days and providing stabilization and reducing cravings and significantly enhancing uh, protection against overdose. This move has been described as a game changer. Advancement in addiction medicine and is available to any Albertan regardless of their circumstances, same day, no matter where you live. You can access this life-saving medication by calling the Virtual Opioid Dependency Program, and we're not doing this alone. This government and our partners, such as uh, police, EMS, fire, and nonprofits, uh, working together with a common goal, to give Albertans the opportunity to access treatment and enter recovery. To anyone out there who is struggling with addiction, know that treatment works and recovery is possible. We have also been expanding services that reach the 70% of Albertans who are dying at home. If you're using drugs at home, you can download and use the Digital Overdose Response System or the DOORS app. It's free, it's secure, it's anonymous, and it could save your life by dispatching a medical response if you overdose. Anyone in Alberta can access opioid addiction treatment on demand through the Virtual Opioid Dependency Program. There's no wait list and people are usually able to start treatment on the same day uh, when they call. All of these initiatives are about building a comprehensive recovery-oriented system of care for Albertans, a system of care that is built on the principle that no one should be left without hope for recovery, a system of care that treats addiction as a healthcare issue and makes recovery available at every point in the system. Everywhere someone turns, recovery should be available to, uh, to, to them and accessible to them, them in this system. This brings me to today, today's announcement. Our government remains committed to ensuring that communities are safe, that people are held accountable for their actions, but we are treating addiction as a health care issue at the same time. Today we're announcing the first of its kind in Canada program. Starting today, people who are arrested and brought to municipal jails will be able to immediately start opioid addiction treatment while in custody regardless of their charges. Through a partnership between local law enforcement and a $1.4 million per year expansion of the virtual opioid dependency program, detainees will have immediate access to evidence-based medications. This includes the gold standard opioid treatment medication Subloxone and the newly funded injectable version Sublocate. To seriously tackle addiction, we are building a comprehensive system that includes the criminal justice system, the healthcare system, and civil society organizations. Today's announcement is about bringing these systems together to connect Albertans with proven treatments that we know work. This is the first of its kind in Canada, but it's not new to the world. When Portugal faced their addiction crisis head-on, the community decided to put police at the center of the process. 
we cannot simply remove our law enforcement officers from the equation. A comprehensive system of care can and must involve our law enforcement officers in the solution. Police officers are not an arm of the state, but they are an extension of the community. Overall, the message remains the same. Treatment works and recovery is possible. I'd like to thank you all today, and I will now invite Chief McPhee to speak. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, and thank you, Minister Ellis. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today at Northwest Campus. This location holds our detainee management unit. And today it represents a hopeful start to recovery for many Edmontonians. Social issues such as mental health and addictions are complex and are often intertwined with the criminal justice system, as the minister said. For some that are arrested and brought here, those underlying issues are daunting, but it's a critical moment where we have an opportunity to help. Our detainee management officers can provide information for external resources and supports. But by having this new direct and immediate access to addiction and recovery specialists, we can save lives. Addiction is a complex issue, and no one should have to wait to receive the care that they need to pursue recovery. This is the perfect example of law enforcement response that treats addiction as a health care issue and ultimately helps people in their pursuit of their recovery. This is the bridge between law enforcement and public health. The addictions crisis doesn't just affect individuals, it affects entire communities. Police and first responders witness and true nature of the addiction crisis every day and are, ex and are experiencing stress and the importance that agencies such as the Edmonton Police Service work alongside governments with our other police partners and our fire partners and other service providers and community operators to uphold the safety and well-being for all Albertans. I've said it before and I will say it again. To make real change in our city, we must have the involvement of police and we must treat addiction as a health care issue while still holding people accountable for their actions. Enforcement alone does not solve the danger that those with addictions face, but neither does doing nothing. We must invest our time into each individual and provide more than the standard arrest, remand, release, repeat cycle. We need to continue building and strengthening a comprehensive recovery oriented community of care, continuum of care. We cannot continue to work in silos and hope our singular approaches will change a person's life. We have to do this together. That is what we're doing here today. We're building another piece of that comprehensive recovery oriented system of care. We're providing another option, another moment in time where people can choose to get treatment, treatment and enter recovery. With this, we are giving people an opportunity to recover, which is ultimately what we are all striving for. We are grateful for the many partners who have joined our dedication to our, toward providing recovery oriented care from our help unit, diversion, desistance branch, to the Health IM technology, and so many initiatives in between. We are changing lives for the better with all encompassing supports. On behalf of the Edmonton Police Service, I want to again thank Minister Ellis and his team, the Government of Alberta, for supporting us to do more for people with addiction. Thank you, and I will now welcome Chief uh, Newfeld from Calgary. Thanks, everyone. So thank you for the opportunity to attend uh, Edmonton today to discuss uh, the situation in Calgary. We know we have a duty of care to people that we take into our custody. Access to the VODP will enhance our ability to provide additional care to those in custody. The well-being of det detainees and individuals that come into our custody is very, very important to us. So far this year, in 2021, we've had about 8,500 detainees that we've taken into custody in Calgary. So in our APU, that would be around 25 people that come through each day. 
I've always said that every interaction with a police officer is a potential turning point. The reality of it is when we take people into custody, uh, for whatever reason, oftentimes it's a, it's a sobering uh, moment, it's a reflective moment, and it's an opportunity to deal with officers and employees who are compassionate and who will actually connect people to services to make change if that's something that they want to do in that moment, and many people do. Offering an opioid treatment program right within our facility means that when people are released from custody, they start out potentially in a much healthier state, which has the opportunity to reduce recidivism, which has the opportunity to reduce victimization and crime, and all of us benefit from that. We know that addiction, as has been said, is a, mental, is a medical condition, a condition, and it needs to be treated with all of the, the care and compassion and the medical support that we can provide in that moment that we're dealing with individuals. We know that when addicted people come into our custody, it can be a scary and difficult time for them. They know and realize that they may not have access to drugs in the case of, of those who are opioid dependent, and sometimes for a significant period of time. While we're able to treat withdrawal symptoms, our current practices do not address addiction itself. The ability to block cravings and reduce the potential for overdose, whether in custody or once free from custody, is, as has been discussed, a potential game changer. This is, of course, a voluntary program. Informed consent is required to be obtained, and our on-site medics will do that prior to any medication being given. We wouldn't be forcing any treatment options on anybody who's, who comes into custody. I think this is an excellent announcement. I think this is another opportunity across the spectrum to be able to deal with and support those who are battling addictions in our communities. And, and on behalf of the Calgary Police Service, I too thank the, uh, the minister and the government for their support and uh, for, for one more way to be able to deal with a very, very difficult and complex issue. Thank you. Hello and, and good morning everyone. I must say uh, to start that the Alberta RCMP is very pleased to be participating in the government of Alberta's virtual, virtual opioid dependency program. With our initial rollout of the program in our detachment areas of Grand Prairie, St. Paul, Gleeshan, Wetaskiwin and Stony Plain. We look forward to the ways in which new evidence-based drugs will be used in frontline interventions for those experiencing opioid addictions, as well as partnering with select pharmacies to help individuals in our custody access such treatment. As we know, the misuse of opioids is a nationwide crisis that affects Albertans right here at home. In many cases, underlying factors such as addictions drive individuals towards criminality. This is not only true for populated city centres, but also within smaller rural communities across our province. In fact, that, in fact, we know that much of the property crime reported in Alberta RCMP jurisdiction is linked to drug use. And while it's our organization's role to uphold and enforce the law, as police, we recognize that we need to work towards more effective responses that address the root causes of criminality. With the implementation of the Virtual Opioid Dependency Program and the public administration of this new treatment, law enforcement agencies can aid in creating ways for offenders to address some of the underlying causes of their criminal behavior. Through preventing opioid withdrawal symptoms and reducing individuals' dependency, these drugs can assist individuals in managing or even treating opioid use disorder. And in this way, we as the Alberta RCMP may hold persons we have in custody accountable while also providing them with necessary health care solutions. We are pleased to partner in this program for the safety and well-being of all Albertans. This includes those experiencing addictions in our rural communities. With this new program, we can play a role in helping individuals access the resources they need and create a stronger, safer Alberta. Thank you.
Thank you, Minister Ellis, <clears throat> Chief McPhee, uh, Chief Newfeld, and Deputy uh, Commissioner Zablocki. Zablocki. Good morning. <clears throat> One of the advantages we have in Alberta is that we have the virtual opioid dependency program, which using technology can reach people all across the province. And it's really quite a privilege for me to stand here with uh, such a group of uh, dedicated people who want to help improve the addiction situation in Alberta, regardless of uh, where we uh, individually serve. Today is another great day for addiction treatment in Alberta. It is in the best interest of detainees, police services, and our communities if people in withdrawal have immediate access to treatment wherever they are, including in police detention. This innovative and powerful initiative will help people in their moment of crisis. This initiative is possible thanks to investments by the Government of Alberta in Alberta's Virtual Opioid Dependency Program, including the recently announced Low Barrier Treatment Division. Alberta's outstanding medication gap coverage program, which now covers the 30-day injectable treatment sublocade, is also a critical component of this initiative. This initiative will be successful thanks to the dedicated police and health care staff here and in other uh, police detention sites like this. I also recognize the dedicated professional staff at Alberta's VODP who are right now and every day helping people get started on their treatment and recovery journeys. The virtual opioid dependency program was started to do system changing work just like this. Effective addiction treatment in municipal jails will relieve suffering and will provide to those who choose it treatment that will improve outcomes and support healing in our communities. This initiative is part of a comprehensive system of care that will save lives. Access to high quality evidence-based addiction treatment matters. This partnership with police services adds another important tool in our effort to help people struggling with addiction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now be uh, going to media. We're running just a few minutes behind today, so I'll ask everyone, media and our participants, just to please keep your questions and answers succinct. Um, we've got a few in the room and a few on the phones. Uh, we're gonna start here in the room today. Each uh, reporter will have one question, one follow-up, and I'll just ask as a reminder to media, please state your name, your outlet, and uh, since we have many participants today, who your question is for. So with that, uh, your mic is open over there. Hello, this is uh, Duncan Kinney from the Progress Report. Um, so we're holding this press conference in a, a place with holding cells, you know, both police chiefs as well as Associate Minister Mike Ellis have talked about treating addiction as a healthcare issue. The question here is for Associate Minister Mike Ellis as well as the two municipal police chiefs. Will you move to decriminalize possession of drugs so that people aren't in prisons for the possession of drugs instead of treating it as a mental health care issue instead of a instead of a criminal issue. You mentioned men mental health care issue uh, as well as um, a medical issue. I mean, this is an illness, right? It's an illness that requires treatment. You know, I think I have to go back to my experience uh, when I did work in uh, the city jail in, in Calgary. Um, there were people that uh, came in there. Uh, they, um, um, they weren't there for simple possession. You know, they had committed a series of, of criminal events, and uh, unfortunately, uh, some of that was was uh, in part due to alcohol or, or drug use, as an example. And um, I used to take the time to talk to these individuals when they were sober, and because that's, you had to be sober to go before a justice of the peace. And each and every time, these people wanted help and they wanted treatment, and that's why we have put together these 8,000 spaces. Uh, that is why we have uh, you know, Dr. Day here uh, to offer the virtual overdose dependency program. Um, in regards to decriminalization, um, I mean, that's, a, that's a, an entire uh, community 
system type of change, and, and I believe that the public needs to be uh, uh, informed as to what the evidence is based upon that. Um, I will tell you this, if we are going to talk about decriminalization and go back to our, our friends in Portugal as an example, just remember that they have a very robust uh, uh, recovery program in place, and I think that's important to have before we can even have that conversation, but we need to have that conversation with the people of Alberta. Let the chiefs speak if they like. I'm not, not sure I really have anything to add. I totally agree with what Mr. Ellis said, and you look at the Portugal model as we're lacking a lot of supports and a lot of things in place before we can get to the period or point of uh, decriminalization. So uh, Chief Newfell, who's the president of ACP, we've made that statement publicly quite some time ago that uh, we don't support decriminalization without um, the necessary supports in place, just as Minister Ellis has articulated. And just quickly, I suppose I'd add that from my experience, I think that model that you talk about, it largely operates now. People are not being arrested, certainly I can speak for Calgary, uh, not being arrested for small amounts of uh, hard drugs and being incarcerated for just that. Typically it's, uh, it's in relation to other crimes, more serious crimes that are being committed. So when we do talk about decriminalization, I think we've, we've heard about this at the national level and we've heard about it at the provincial level as well. I would say that it's almost a distinction without a difference. I think nationally, police chiefs have said they support decriminalization with appropriate supports. And then what we're saying is we don't think that necessarily, the necessary supports are all in place there just yet. So it's a, it's a, it's a discussion that's moving forward, but I, I don't think the system is operating that way now as it is practically. Um, and so that, that, would be the, that would be the observation I would add. Thank you. Did you have a follow up? Yeah, just a simple uh, yes or no question for Police Chief McPhee. Uh, will you be asking Edmonton City Council for to fund the acquisition and use of body cameras? You know, we have made that decision. We just, as you're aware, we just got the news of our budget yesterday. Uh, we're going to sit down, we're going to evaluate what we need to do, and we'll go from there, but we haven't made any decisions on that. Thanks. We've got one more in person here. Uh, Jeremy Thompson here with uh, CTV News. A question for Associate Minister Ellis. Um, you know, decriminalization is one thing. Um, there's also questions about, you know, should the government be providing kind of a safe supply um, of, of opioids to, you know, reduce uh, the risk of overdoses, et cetera. Um, and I understand that there's, you know, you've received reports about the benefits of, of having a safe supply. Um, you know, will, will your government commit to, to looking into that further? Well, we are going to look into that, and that's why that's why we have this select special committee uh, to precisely examine uh, safe supply. And I look forward to uh, testimony from both sides, those that are in support and those who are um, uh, opposed to safe supply. And I look forward to that report and uh, hearing what they have to say. Yeah, yeah follow up for uh, for Chief McPhee. Actually, um, you mentioned the budget. Uh, it's first first chance I've had to. to to ask you about it, you know, it's an $11 million increase, or decrease, rather, for, for next year. It's still a $1 million increase. Uh, just some reaction to, you know, after all of the discussion and presentation you went through to council, having this be the result. You know what, as I said earlier, we're gonna look at what this actually means to us. Is there gonna be some impacts? You bet there are, but uh, certainly uh, rule number one is we're going to protect the jobs of our folks and we're going to protect public safety the best we can with the resources we have but other than that we'll get back to you further i guess that decision comes on january 1st so we're going to have to make some changes pretty quick thanks and we're going to go to the phones for our next question operator can you please put through the first caller adrian williams cbc french Hi, uh, my question is for uh, Associate Minister. It's concerning the lawsuit over new licensing requirements for supervised consumption sites. Uh, my question is, what exactly are you trying to accomplish um, with these new requirements? How does asking for a healthcare number help connect people to services? And can you give an example of services that that the um, that Alberta was not able to provide to people because they didn't have this kind of information already. Uh, well, thank you. Well, uh, they're actually before the courts right now, so I'm not going to comment uh, on that much further. In fact, I think they're in court today, to be quite frank with you. Uh, that question might actually be suited for Dr. Nathaniel Day. I mean, I will just uh, maybe ask him to supplement. 
But um, just remember, uh, folks that are uh, using the uh, supervised consumption sites or um, overdose prevention sites, as, as it's also known, um, have very complex issues. I mean, as I've already indicated here, this is an illness. It's, it's a, an illness that requires treatment. And in some cases, uh, some people um, uh, may require additional uh, medical treatment. Uh, maybe it has to do with uh, needles and infections. And again, maybe this is where I'll ask the doctor to supplement. Uh, or maybe there are other issues uh, pertaining to, um, uh, you know, the, the complexity of, of consuming uh, narcotics. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll ask the doctor if you wouldn't mind supplementing there. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, our virtual opioid dependency program provides supports in many locations all across Alberta, including in supervised consumption sites. And uh, it would be impossible for us to actually provide treatment uh, and treatment access for a person without knowing who they are. Uh, in terms of making referrals, and even in terms of, uh, of, of providing medications that access important programs like our GAP uh, medication coverage program, which I'll use my opportunity at the po podium to highlight is uh, unique, innovative, and uh, life-changing for many people all across Alberta. And I've heard from my colleagues across the country that uh, they wish that they had a GAP coverage uh, program for medications in their provinces. And so I would uh, urge anyone who is, uh, is listening to this to, uh, to look into what the GAP medication coverage program is and to encourage your uh, leaders in other provinces to uh, also look at uh, mimicking Alberta's excellent program. Thanks, Adrian. Did you have a follow-up? Yeah. Um, so some groups that are involved in... Um, these kinds of issues, they say that um, asking or requiring documents like uh, or information like a healthcare number will deter people from using services like the supervised consumption sites. Um, wouldn't it be more, I don't know, effective to only ask for those requirements or start the process for obtaining a healthcare number once people actually agree? To, or decide that they're ready to enter to enter those treatment programs. I think the simple answer to this is uh, nobody will be denied any service if they refuse to provide um, information uh, such as their name. So uh, again, we want people to provide uh, their information just as the doctor articulated, so they can get whatever medical treatment uh, is necessary for the illness that they actually have. However, if they choose not to provide their uh, personal information, uh, that uh, in itself, uh, that may happen, but just to be clear, they will not be denied any service. Thanks, we've got time for two more callers. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Catherine Krakowski, Alberta Today. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, maybe you can get back to me on specific numbers, but I'm wondering, of, of the total arrests, um, how, how much crime is um, committed by somebody who has an addiction and is maybe committing crimes such as theft or break and enter? Like, how, how big of a problem is it? I'm not sure I can be specific, but let's just say lots, uh, by far the majority of, of some type of uh, substance uh, issues, for sure. Catherine, did you have a follow-up? Yeah. Um, well, well, you. I believe the minister had mentioned um, other substances such as alcohol use. Um, and, and oftentimes people who are using opioids are using other substances such as stimulants. Um, what is the plan to address um, other types of addiction and, and interaction with, with people who have other types of addiction in the criminal justice system? Uh, what, what, part of what we're creating here is when we say recovery-oriented system of care, I mean, that, that isn't specific to um, uh, opioids. Uh, I mean, that, that includes alcohol, it includes crystal meth, it includes heroin, it includes whatever, uh, you know, whatever that uh, drug is that the person 
may wish to get off of. So again, when we, we talk about the recovery-oriented system of care, it's about helping people in a pathway uh, to wellness so that they can live uh, happy and productive lives again. But I think the doctor might want to supplement this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, if you look at somebody who's battling with an opioid use disorder and they have a co-occurring addiction with, with other substances, so benzos, stimulants, uh, alcohol, uh, the evidence is, is very clear that treating the opioid use disorder actually helps settle the other addictions uh, in a large number of people. So for example, in our own program, uh, people who come in with opioid use disorder and have been using methamphetamine, for example, uh, and so in, during COVID, we've seen about 50% of our, our clients are co-using methamphetamine. Uh, what we find is that with effective evidence-based treatment, uh, the co-use of methamphetamine drops to about uh, 6% uh, over one year. And so we see significant improvements in care if, if we can get a person engaged into treatment. Um, that being said, though, there are lots of people out there who are struggling with other addictions that do not include opioids. And so as uh, Minister Ellis uh, appropriately stated, it's important to recognize that uh, there isn't a, a single tool that's going to be effective for every problem. And that's why we're developing a system of care with many tools uh, that can deal with many problems. Um, yeah. The only thing I would add to that is I think it's pretty important to realize that take Edmonton Police Service Calgary, very similar. Curtis will have this in some of his as well. Is this is a health response. The normal thing if we didn't have this People are just on that remand, release cycle. They go in, they come out. This gives the opportunity for a medical health professional, such as Dr. Day or one of his colleagues, our paramedics in the cell blocks, to give these folks hope and help them get their lives back. And in some cases, because of, and Dr. Day is the expert on this, but it's going to give some time that hopefully they don't overdose and there's some time for some interventions here. And I think we have to keep that at the center of this discussion when we're talking about a system of care. We as police chiefs have been saying this for a long time, and that's going to be a critical part of the discussion. And, you know, the province's lead on this uh, certainly is uh, something that we recognize and appreciate, but this is that bridge between law enforcement and public health. Those two work together hand in hand, and if we have an opportunity to save lives and to use the human factor, such as the medical system, to help, you know, this is pretty much common sense. So I just want to thank you for that. Operator, can you please put through the last caller? Ashley Joanno, Post Media. Hi, um, thanks for taking my call. I, I just want to confirm uh, one thing real quick. In terms of, everyone has talked a lot about how there are other services, but in terms of this expansion, we're specifically talking about medication that's being offered, correct? Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, what what the virtual opioid dependency program can offer, and, and we're talking about in the detention units where the person's stay is very short. What we're offering is assessment with a multidisciplinary team member and with a prescriber in our program that's uh, most typically a physician uh, who's an addiction uh, medicine specialist who then can pr provide uh, options and uh, recommendations for treatment. Uh, from there, one of the uh, really great uh, opportunities that we have in Alberta is that we have seven day a week access to bridging care uh, thanks to the government's investment in VODP. And so if a person is then released from police custody uh, later that day or the next day, that person has the opportunity to continue with treatment and VODP will assist that person in bridging to local most appropriate care as needed. Ashley, did you have a follow up? I did. I just wonder um, what kind of, like, are these people on staff or are they coming from other places? What kind of training are they getting to, to offer this support? So if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's around uh, what training and, and, and sort of what the backgrounds of the VODP staff are. 
because if that's the case, Al Al Alberta Health Services is, is the uh, organization that uh, that uh, runs the virtual opioid dependency program. Our staff are uh, come from a variety of backgrounds: addiction counseling, social work, and nursing, and uh, and of course, our medical staff are uh, physicians uh, trained uh, in addictions. Thanks, everyone.